and warm greetings from Georgia State University's Center for International Business Education and Research, Cyber, in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Lian Liu, a professor and the director at the Institute of International Business at GSU. Our webinar series is brought to you by the Cyber Network's Minority Serving Institutions Consortium. I'm thrilled to share that this is our 97th webinar since April 2020. Over the last four years, we've delved into a variety of topics in international business, drawing on the expertise of scholars, master teachers, and business executives. It's been an enriching journey with about 19,000 participants joining us from 115 countries. We thank each and every one of you for joining us from different time zones. We appreciate that you choose to spend the hour with us. Just a reminder, we're recording today's session. If you want to watch again or share it with others, you can find this and previous recordings on the GSU Cyber website or our YouTube channel. Uh, when we wrap up, Please remember to take a moment to fill out our brief survey before you log out. Your feedback is valuable and gives us ideas for future webinars. Uh, today's webinar on navigating global leadership development is a joint session with the DBA program here at Georgia State University. And we welcome current students and alumni of the program without, um, Further ado, I turn to today's moderator, the J. Mac Robinson Professor and DBA Program Director, Dr. Charles Donarock, and he will introduce today's speaker. So Charles, you're next. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Leanne. This is a wonderful opportunity to talk about global leadership and perhaps everybody is wondering in the, in the, in the light of in the light of everything that we are seeing today, does global leadership matter at all? And how does it matter? How does one become a global leader in today's context? I mean, I can't find a better speaker than uh, what who we have today. Um, it's my pleasure and an honor to introduce Dr. Alan Bird. Alan Bird comes to us. Uh, Alan. 40 years of work in this area, like uh, from 86 PhD from University of Oregon and, and from then to multiple countries. Uh, start video, one second. I think we already have to start. Okay. Yeah, thank you. There we go. Yeah. So has been uh, uh, multiple places. So right now he's the president of the Kozai group since 2001, and he's also the senior professor at Goa Institute of Management. And previously, for, from 2009 to 2019, he was the Dala and Frederick Brodsky Trustee Professor in Global Business at Northeastern University. And prior to Northeastern, he had been the professor of Japanese studies and director of International Business Institute at College of Business at University of Missouri, St. Louis and uh, visiting professor in, in multiple universities, including Japan, uh, Rikyu University, Columbia University, Monterey Institute of International Business, and multiple others. And what, what, what is the distinctive about uh, Professor Bird is uh, he didn't stop at just publishing in the international business journals or uh, academic journals. He went on to create an instrument for which he is well known for, and he's going to talk about. And he has done tons of. I mean, if I had to list, it will be like it will go on. Hundreds of companies, multinational companies, to give them an idea how to develop global leadership competency, and and that's the mission of the Kozai Group. That uh, probably he will uh, we will hear him talk about it. He has authored or co-authored or edited nine books. 40 plus book chapters, 60 plus journal articles. And one of the books that some of you may be aware of is The Advances in Global Leadership that comes out every year. It's one of those feats that you have accomplished. Uh, this is now in the 15th, 
15th year. 15th edition of the book that is coming out this year. So that has been a substantive. In fact, uh, if you look at global leadership, uh, pretty much the singular uh, credit goes to uh, Professor Bird and his team to get this on the map. So it's my distinct pleasure to invite uh, Alan. And, and let me uh, let me ask Alan, how did you get this get this started at all? Like maybe a bit of the journey of yours uh, in in global leadership. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting that you asked that, Charles. I I uh, I think that uh, we probably don't really understand our careers until we're well into them. So uh, when I started down this path, I wasn't thinking global leadership. I was really thinking about how do people who are different work effectively with each other. And um, and that began really looking at how Japanese and, and Americans worked with each other. And then over time, I became interested in the in some of the cultural challenges. And and that led um, eventually, I would say, towards the, the latter part of the 90s to a focus on leadership and particularly global leadership, uh, which we and we may talk about as a distinction there. But what I was encountering was that every study, every survey of, of CEOs of large multinational corporations from the early 1990s, and it's still the case up to the present, when, when asked what was their greatest challenge, invariably the answer was the same. The greatest challenge is that there is a, an inadequate supply of global leaders, uh, global managerial talent. Companies were not able to grow as fast as they wanted. They were not able to expand in markets. They, they encountered obstacles because the supply of, of leaders who could work effectively with people who were different than themselves. And I always frame it that way because there are so many differences, not just cultural differences. Um, that supply was um, was inadequate. And so I turned my attention to that issue. And I found that uh, much of my work prior to that point had really been moving in that direction. So that's where I'm at now. The world has gotten, as we like to say, the world's gotten smaller. I don't know that it's gotten smaller, but it's gotten better connected. Mm -hmm. And as it's gotten better connected, the number of people who are different from each other who are working together has grown. And uh, and there is a clear need for leadership, people who can who can help direct and uh, and shape how people work effectively together. And can you talk a bit about the COSI group? Uh, because that's a very unique for an academic to build this type of a consulting group that started a major things. It it is, and it uh, it really grew out of my work. I I started my career at New York University, and worked with some colleagues there, Roger Dunbar in particular. And we were interested in helping people figure out how to work effectively together. And we we began some things then, and um, and it was it was really a challenge. Things kind of moved to the back burner in terms of developing some software. Roger and I developed some software, which uh, which won some awards for its effectiveness. And we worked with some accounting firms like. Uh, uh, KPMG, Pete Marwick, and um, and 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 now I'm. Mm. I, I think I think they were the the major one. Um, we worked with several others, but we had a real challenge moving forward in that. I, and I think we were um, we were on the wrong track. I'll I'll say we were focused on on primarily cultural issues. Uh, when I moved to the University of St. Louis, I had a colleague who was uh, responsible for, um, he, was a, he was a senior executive at Northwest Airlines. And he came to me and he said, um, I'm starting a company that will lease airline pilots. Interesting mm -hmm. phenomena. I said, lease airline pilots, what's that about? And he says, well, my company is going to hire airline pilots, and then we're going to lease them to global carriers, mm -hmm. carriers outside the US and, 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 uh, and Europe um, don't have access to those pilots. So we're going to hire them and we're going to put them to work there. I know how important certain managerial capabilities are, certain managerial competencies are, particularly some that have to do with, with working across cultures. 
is there an instrument that I could use that would help me identify who those talents are? And I said, well, regrettably, I don't think there is, but I have been working on one, you know, and I kind of put it on the shelf and he came back and he said, well, I would really appreciate it if you could, you know, if you'd be willing to do that. And so then I reached out to some partner, some, some colleagues, uh, Michael Stevens, who is a psychometrician, he was at the University of Missouri St. Louis, and then I and then I got in touch with Mark Mendenhall and Gary Odu, and they were they had written some of the set they I say written they had done the seminal research on um, on cultural adaptation and adjustment and effectiveness, and so and and I'd always been impressed by their uh, approach, and so I I spoke with them. And we decided to go together and and really concentrate on on developing an assessment tool that would help companies both select and think and and think about how to develop uh, global leaders. And so, out of that genesis, uh, we moved forward. Uh, we added Joyce Osland along the way, a a, a very talented um, intercultural and um, and global leadership mm -hmm. researcher. And so the, the five of us really moved forward from there. And our goal was to, uh, to provide assessment tools that would help companies identify uh, competencies that we had been able to identify in the research um, that had been done that were related to effective global leadership capability. And so, the COSI group was born out of a, a desire to take the research that we were doing and put it into a package that could be used effectively by companies to, to make very practical decisions, both mm -hmm. in selecting global leaders mm -hmm. and in, in and in developing global leaders yeah. by by helping them understand what was important. And 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 uh, Alan, before you start on the presentation, uh what runs, I think most of my audience will be thinking, given all that is happening in the global side, geopolitical tension that's going on, uh, does what does global leadership, being a global leader mean in this context of uh, such, a, uh, such an environment? And the more and more as we see this uh, populism uh, and yeah. fractionalism, how do you see this? And then in that context, tell us what would be a global leader and then take on. That's a, a, a that's a great question, and I think um, when we talk about global leadership, there's a tendency to say, well, what what makes global leadership different than than what I'll call domestic or typical leadership, mainstream leadership? And I I would say the answer is that global leaders are asked to uh, take on a an extraordinary level of complexity in their work. And this is not just about mm. cultural differences, but it has to do with the nature of the environment they're working in. And, and what that environment looks like is an environment that is highly interdependent. Mm. And that interdependence then creates some real challenges in terms of, of the level of um, the level of complexity they're dealing with. And then you can multiply that co complexity by the level of diversity they're dealing with. A, a simple example, one of my former students is the head of a, a consortium of hospitals in Los Angeles. Uh, she's over the HR function. And you might not think of a, a, an LA consortium of hospitals as a, as a global operation, but in that consortium, there are 74 nationalities there are 26 different languages. I, wow. I can't tell you how many different religious yeah. affiliations, mm. but that is an incredibly complex mm. situation to deal with. So how do you, you know, how do you work in, in, in that setting? That's, that's a challenge. So in addition to the interdependence, the diversity, and then there's just um, what I would call flux, just rapid, unpredictable change. Mm -hmm. That, that managers are dealing with in a global context. Mm -hmm. Now we might step back and say, well, gee, you know, any, you know, any leader in any situation may be dealing with a great deal of complexity. And I'll say, well, yes, that is mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. And what that really speaks to is the global leaders we've identified as operating in that environment. Mm -hmm. but, um, but to some extent, all leaders are confronted with that. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what that means in terms of how global leaders lead, mm -hmm. <clears throat> there has been a there's been a greater mm. a, a greater shift in in how in how organizations function and operate during the 20th century they were primarily they were primarily we can think of them as as vertically organized we had layers of management we had spans of control we had uh, you know chains of command and we thought uh, often in terms of lines and boxes with that in that heightened interdependence and and the challenge of the diversity that it introduced, organizations have shifted dramatically from what I would call a hierarchical leadership structure to a vertical leadership structure. There's much more, it's much less about chains of command and spans of control. It's increasingly about coordination and collaboration. It's not about controlling information. It's about sharing and creating information. And that places a different demand on leadership. And probably that's most clearly reflected in, as we looked at uh, what global leaders do that's different, uh, what we found is overwhelmingly, they spend a great deal of their time. Mm -hmm. uh, some would argue more than 70% of a global leader's time is spent in what we would call boundary spanning activities. Mm -hmm. uh, boundary spanning within organizations, boundary spanning across organizations. For example, one of the uh, we did some research on it in, in a particular line that focused on what we called expert global leadership, those who were most talented, most capable. And one of the leaders we interviewed was responsible for the integration and restructuring of 90 different. He, he was with an accounting firm, 90 different accounting operations in, in those are spread across 90 countries. And the, the question was, how could they integrate and restructure those to more effectively service their, their global clients? Mm -hmm. To do that, it wasn't a matter of you know going into a single place. He had to travel extensively. He had to work extensively. He wasn't working just with senior people, but he was working with people lower down in the organization and different uh, just an extraordinary task. Mm -hmm. And the majority of that time was spent crossing over mm -hmm. organizational, or I, I should say internal organizational boundaries. Uh, global leaders spend much more time in it doing that. But I would say in, in, in this day and age, most companies have large numbers of employees who do that. Mm -hmm. We think about that. Uh, there's much more, um, when we think about global virtual teams, for example, what we're thinking about are companies who uh, are teams who often are drawn from different units with, within the organization, from different countries, different time zones, different geographies, different functional areas, and we're asking them to work together to collaborate. And what this means is often um, they can't rely on the traditional methods for getting things done of saying, mm -hmm. as your boss, I'm asking you to do this. They have to instead say, mm -hmm. you know, hey, could you help me out with that? So there's much more of that coordination and collaboration. So you ask for a de definition of global leaders. A global leader is anyone in the organization who exercises a positive influence that crosses international boundaries to accomplish organizational goals. Mm -hmm. And in that definition, then there is room for both the CEO and for the receptionist. Mm -hmm. Anybody who is engaged in that sort of activity that crosses na those national boundaries um, and is working to accomplish organizational goals. I, I, a few years back, I had an in a conversation with a uh, warehouse manager at AMD Semiconductor in, in uh, Bangkok, Thailand. And his global leadership involved as product was being shipped to different plants uh, within AMD to their Shenzhen operation or to their, uh, their Kuala Lumpur operation, he would pay attention to where things were going. And if he noticed that a shipment seemed to be out of the ordinary, he would uh, proactively hop on the phone, 
call his counterpart in the warehouse in, in Kuala Lumpur, for example, and clarify that, yes, indeed, this was a non-standard order. This was out of, and that was to help, help uh, that was to help accomplish positive goals, mm -hmm. or I should say positively, the goals of the organization. And he did that crossing national boundaries. Increasingly, lots of employees have that responsibility. We, uh, we, I think we have to be careful to distinguish between who we think of as leaders and who exercises leadership qualities or behaviors. Mm -hmm. Yes, and 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 uh, and then look, your slides, you can. <laughs> so uh, your work on how do we build global leaders has been a, a big a big interest for a lot of us, and you you and Joyce Oslin and the team had worked systematically on this. Maybe could. If you would mind taking us through this, some of the contributions you have made over the time, like how, what does what does it take to build these global leaders? And and a lot of my uh, friends from the DBA uh, who have graduated, they are all in different places and uh, serving different institutions. How do they develop this global leadership? Yeah. So let me let me talk about where we started, and this was some work that uh, that Joyce and I did, which was. We started by looking at what global leaders are actually doing, and we broke that down into, into a, a really micro level and said, what exactly is happening in this process? And it begins with, with entering a situation, being in a, being in a situation where the first thing that a that a leader, ha a global leader, has to do is has to perceive and analyze, decode the situation. What's going on here? How do I make sense of this? What uh, what are the relevant uh, pieces of information? Who are the you know who are the relevant actors? And this requires some some real um, some real skills, some real capabilities in 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 perceiving and analyzing and how we make sense. So there are some cognitive behaviors that are that are involved here. I, I won't go into great length, but for example, global leaders require cognitive complexity, the ability to think complexly about things. And, and very simply, one way to think about that is, as you look at a situation, how many different ways can you interpret that situation? For example, maybe you have a, maybe you have a subordinate who leaves work early one afternoon mm -hmm. and there are different ways you could interpret that. You could say, well, he's lazy, or maybe there's a family emergency that's come up, or maybe a client has called him and asked him to visit. Cognitive complexity is reflected in your ability to think of a, a wide variety of possible explanations. And, and the reason that's important is because in, in a global context, it can be very difficult to interpret what there are lots of ambiguous signals. Mm. There are lots of, there's a large amount of incomplete information. And if you tend to think in black and white thinking, my employee left early, he's supposed to work until five. Mm. He's a lazy employee, you know, mm. or he's a bad employee. Then I've already short circuited mm. the, you know, the situation. So that first, that first part is there are a set of capabilities that involve being able to perceive and analyze and decode. That, if you can do that well, then you you you've started the process. But then the next step is: yeah. Can I interrupt on that? Like, yeah. Does is it a cultural phenomenon? Like the one that you're like the the black and white versus uh, seeing it in complexity. Is that a cultural context? Is that a is that coming out of cultural, or is it something that people can develop over time? It's it's. Um, we don't have any evidence that this is uh, that, that this culturally derived that mm. that Indians are better th at, mm. at thinking cognitively complexly than um, than say Japanese or you know or or Vietnamese. Um, it uh, there there are a number of factors that that influence this, but quite frankly, one of the ways you can develop cognitive complexity is by working through an exercise like I just shared. Mm. You can look at a situation and then say, what are the different ways I could interpret what's going on here? Mm. And this is actually a very good exercise mm. in different settings. Mm. Uh, I myself 
um, because I travel a lot, I spend a lot of time in airports and often I'll sit and observe people mm. and I'll make up different stories about, you know, why they're traveling. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, it looks like they're a husband and wife. I, you know, I wonder, I wonder, are they going on vacation, you know, mm. or maybe this is a business trip. You know, I wonder whose business trip it is. Is it the wives? Is it the husband? So that, that process of, of, working, uh, of thinking through different scenarios, different explanations can help you develop a, a, a cognitive complexity. Mm. And, and I should point out that that cognitive complexity is, is specific to particular situations or settings. Mm. For example, chess players are remarkably uh, complex thinkers. When it, came, when it comes to positions on the board and how they play a game. But that doesn't mean they're, they're cognitive complex uh, in how they think about human relationships. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have a question from one of our participants, like uh, where do you see the, is it about, what's the difference between a bridge maker, boundary spanner? Is that a similar thing as? Complexity. What a what a great question! Um, in some respects, they are the same. People who engage in bridging, um, but boundary spanning can can accomplish a number of 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 functions, and bridging is not just one of them. They can also be engaged in bonding, mm -hmm. just strengthening relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be engaged. Um, Sometimes we think of boundary spanners as uh, as being pipelines mm -hmm. that, that there are information flows back and forth, and and that doesn't necessarily mean they're building a bridge. It may just be that they're sharing information, mm -hmm. and you know that that may lead in different directions. So boundary spanning, I would I would characterize as a a broader concept concept. Mm -hmm. than than the bridge maker or the or the bridge builder. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this the second category, if if I've accurately perceived, I then have to a, a identify what's the appropriate course of action. What do I do here? And often there are a variety of of directions that one can go. And again, there are so, there are competencies that are associated with with being able to you know make better choices about which course of action to take. Mm. Um, can I, so uh, I have uh, Dr. Gable, Paula Gable on the screen. She's a, a cognitive psychologist yeah. and also a DBA grad. Yeah. And she's asking as a person who works as a clinician and consultant in the mental health field, we like to think of cognitive complexity as a developmental trait. A person's yeah. world view grows, their ability to think more complex also grows. I mean, to some extent, uh, Paula, I'm not sure if you are implying this, this over time, it's a natural development. Is that what you are uh, looking at? It, it, it can be a natural development. And I would say as, a, as, a, as something that can be developed, the more experiences one has, the more varied one, uh, more varied experiences one has, the more likely one is to develop cognitive complexity, but there are other there are other factors that will play into that. Mm. For example, um, <clears throat> I may have varied experiences, but some of those ver experiences may be very negative. Mm. And that may then lead me and and I, I'm sure the doctor could can could address those sorts of issues. Those may lead me to react negatively mm. um, to rather than expand to withdraw. Uh, there's some research that comes out of France, for example. We often, in, in global business, we often talk about a, uh, an ethnocentric mindset or a geocentric mindset. And the research out of France suggests that it's possible to develop a mindset that is less globally oriented. As a result of our international experiences, mm -hmm. Mm. We withdraw from the world, okay. mm. and he refers to that as a, an, an anomic mindset. Interesting. I've never uh, thought of that one. Thank you. Mm. So, and that's that's part of what makes this such a challenge is the interplay between the different mm. the different characteristics, the different competencies that we look at. Someone who is low 
on what we would call emotional resilience, mm -hmm. resilience or hardiness mm -hmm. may find those experiences not just challenging but overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Somebody who has, you know, who's who's emotionally resilient, who is hardy, may find those experiences enriching, mm -hmm. energizing. Mm -hmm. They, you know, it, it spurs them on to greater growth. Mm -hmm. And so as we look at developing global leaders, we we need to consider the wide variety and what I would call a profile of, of competencies and think about how those fit together. Mm -hmm. And and you have a you have a list of competencies that I, I let you we got quite a few questions <laughs> coming, but we want to get through one. Yeah. More that. Well yeah. let me let me just finish up. Mm -hmm. So our kind of our three part phase is mm -hmm. once you've selected an a, appropriate course of action, you then have to have the behavior of flexibility and discipline to enact it. So this is a this is a, a, a complex set of capabilities one has to have. You can get the first two right. I, I perceive the situation. I've, I've chosen the right course of action, but I can't execute. Mm -hmm. You know, or I I I, don't, I lack that capability. So with that in mind, mm -hmm. as we were looking at global leadership competencies. Thank you. One of my competencies is not technology. Um, as we were looking at these competencies, what we found in organizations were um, could be grouped roughly into, into six broad buckets, if you will. And the social and and those buckets could be divided between social competencies and technical competencies. Now, what I'll note is when we go into organizations, often what we find is people are selected for international assignments based on what we would call here their technical competencies, their global business experience, their global expert organizing expertise, their visioning. These would be more broadly general managerial capabilities and skills. Mm -hmm. But what were most important, what were, if you will, the glue that was holding all of this together, those were what we would call social competencies that have to do with managing intercultural relationships with particular types of cognitive orientations. We've talked about uh, cognitive complexity. Another one would be a global mindset, mm -hmm. thinking globally about things. And then there were some, uh, we'll call them some traits and values mm -hmm. that that people bring to uh, their work. Uh, one particular trait that a number of people studying global leaders have identified, uh, and I think probably among them uh, Stuart Black and Hal Gregerson, Alan Morrison were particularly focused on the trait of curiosity, people who are curious about the world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's often reflected in the types yes. and, and numbers of questions they ask when they go into situations. Mm -hmm. They're, they're trying to find out more, they're trying to learn more, or when they're in different situations, their, their tendency to explore those situations rather than to, I would say, passively experience them, that those social competencies were far more critical in distinguishing, separating out the really effective global leaders from those who just kind of got the job done at it at an average level, if you will. And so those are the things that uh, the in, within the COSI group we have focused on mm -hmm. and uh, and work to develop. There, there are two questions that are coming from on that front. Uh, Dr. Rivera's one of the questions is it's like, you can train people to be managers, but not leaders. Uh, to what extent can you really train them to be leaders? And the other question that comes, shouldn't it include cultural adaptation? If so, how we, we see often global leaders who are very ethnocentric. I boy, to, some some good questions. Let me let me approach those in some different ways. Um, I tried to make a distinction earlier, and I'll come back to it. There are people in organizations we refer to as leaders, mm. and then there is the act of leadership. Mm of positive, positively influencing, and in this case, across national boundaries, mm. um, pe other people in order to accomplish organizational goals. Um, can people, are we talking about managers? Are we talking about leaders? With, with my definition, we're talking about leaders. And so in that context, 
that warehouse mm. foreman in, in AMD in Bangkok. Mm. That is, whether we call him a leader or whether we just call him a foreman, mm. he's exercising leadership as, as we think about it. And so in that context across the organization, is it possible to develop leadership as opposed to management? Um, yes, I believe it is, mm. absolutely. I, I've seen it happen. Mm. Having said that, my, my nature as an academic is to also qualify and note that variations in people's competencies and people's ability to develop competencies mean that some people will develop greater leadership mm. capability than others. If I mm. if I use an athletic mm. uh, example, I love basketball. I wanted to play in the NBA. Uh, I worked really hard, but there were limits to my abilities to develop those talents. I I simply my my capacities were constrained, and so in the same way, yes, I believe that all people. There's a second aspect to this, though, and within the context of the work you're doing, that may require different types of leadership capability, and also provide different types of leadership opportunities. There's no question, mm -hmm. even as I characterize that warehouse foreman as a global as as demonstrating global leadership mm. the ceo at amd uh -huh. mm. has greater potential to have an impact mm. and to lead mm. the warehouse foreman has it has the limited scope of their job mm. and their work responsibility the of influence um, yes absolutely mm. And so that's some that's something to keep in mind. This was reflected IBM in in the early well about 2012 13 um, undertook a massive effort in this regard to respond to to the demands for greater global global leadership capability. And they actually divided their employees into four different classes or groups based on what were the demands of the work and and the likely requirements of the work mm. in terms of demonstrating global leadership mm. um, capability, and not just capability, but global leadership uh, talent. Mm. And, mm. and so I think that's important. Mm. Um, and, and in fact, uh, Dr. Blount, uh, John Blount is asking, uh, you can train people to be a manager, but you have to want to be a leader, particularly in the context of global leader, like. How do we do? I mean, there has to be a deep desire to be a global leader, isn't it? What it's it, uh, that question goes right to the heart of it. Yes, you have to want to. The approach that we use in developing global leaders is one of first assessing, identifying baseline competencies. We have a set uh, within our global competencies inventory of sixteen uh, different. Uh, characteristics, capabilities that uh, the global leaders need. And, and then we, we've, with that baseline information, we identify particular competencies that uh, are appropriate for that particular individual to work on. But that development effort only works if two things are present. The first is, are they motivated? which is the willingness component. If they're motivated, that addresses one portion of it. But the second part is, do they have the capability? And my capability here, I'm not talking about an inner capacity, but what I'm talking about is, do they have the resources available to develop? Mm -hmm. Quite often within organizations, what we'll see is they're, they're, they're trying to take mid-level managers to the next level and they have these people identified as their future global leaders or tabbed for global assignments and they want to develop them, but the demands of their current work positions do not give them any latitude. They don't have the time and resources to mm. devote to development. Mm. Now, there are different strategies for working with this and working around that, mm. but 
if you if you take a highly demanding job and then approach that individual and say, oh, by the way, we'd like you to take an additional half an hour a day to work on this. Mm. Okay. Where does that half an hour come mm. from? So you, there has to be a willingness and there has to be some type of a slack to allow for this capability development. Yeah, well, we, mm. as I say, we call it, uh, a, is there the capacity? Is there are there the resources available? Resources. And time is quite frankly, time is usually one of the most valuable and difficult to secure. Mm. Um, but there may be other supporting resources, and this is where organizations can be extremely effective, mm. is in taking that into account. Mm. Um, for example, one organization uh, in their development program had mentors assigned to these leaders that they were developing, people that could help them develop, but needed to rethink how their mentor programming was working because often the people they were developing didn't have the time or opportunity to meet with the mentors. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, good, I good idea, but we need to make sure the resources are there. And when you when you look at social and technical competencies. Where have you seen much harder? Which one is harder to develop uh, between the two? It's um, the technical competencies often receive more attention within the organization. Mm -hmm. There's often, um, in terms of, for example, training programs, mm -hmm. there's often more training provided, more options for training provided there. And there's more that can be done on the job with the uh, with the social competencies, those are hard to develop. and and you'll notice at the bottom of the social competencies there are there are listed traits and values. Mm. Specific behavioral skills mm. can be developed. Changing one's personality characteristics, predisposition from, being an introvert to being an extrovert, that can be extremely difficult. Now, recent research suggests that um, predispositional changes are possible. Mm -hmm. And under certain circumstances, and as it turns out, one of those circumstances is international, intercultural situations. Those experiences appear to have a tremendous transformative potential. But, but even so, there are... The, is it necessary to take someone who's an introvert and make them an extrovert? Mm. And our answer is, no. well, there's probably some value in moving the needle a little bit. But introverts can learn extrovert behaviors. One of, one of the great books, one of the classics that I recommend to my students still is Del Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, remembering yeah. names, mm -hmm. you know, greeting people, yeah, all of these things. Well, extroverts do this naturally. It, yeah. it, it's, it's second mm -hmm. nature. Introverts, it may be uncomfortable at mm -hmm. first, and, and it may not be their natural inclination, but they can learn those behaviors. Mm -hmm. And as they learn those behaviors, then mm -hmm. they can be more effective. Yeah. I mean, since we're talking about learning the behavior, there are two questions out there. Like one, I want to pick up uh, Dr. Malika Richards' question. Uh, Malika, yeah. thank you for that. Since many of our audience are in classrooms or L&D role, learning and development role, like what would be some two classroom activities that you have found to be the best to develop some, some competencies? Like maybe in undergraduate students first, and then we can go to the executive side. Well, first of all, hello, Malika. It's good to see. Good, good to know that you're in touch. I have transformed my teaching as over the last twenty years, as we have been working on these. Um, my my classroom. I, I want to say my classroom. My my approach to my courses is is overwhelmingly developmental. What I teach is focused on helping my students to develop. And I do that with a fairly simple process. And I've, I've written about this. There are, there are some research out there. Mark, I know Mark Mendenhall has written to this as well. The approach is very simple. We take, uh, we, we conduct an assessment of some sort. And this can be a psychometric assessment using some of the tools from the COSI group. It can be a self-inventory. 
uh, but it's an assessment, kind of a baseline. Where am I at right now? So I, I put the students through activities that help them identify where are they at with regard to particular competencies. Mm -hmm. I then ask them to create a personal development plan. We can go back into lock and and uh, and goal setting theory and smart goals, goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. Mm -hmm. And I ask them to develop um, as short as eight weeks. Uh, my students in India, I don't have as much time to work with. We set an eight week time period. So they set up a, pl a plan to identify um, a set of goals that they'll work on for an eight week period. And then they report weekly to me mm. on what they do. Nothing lengthy. I, have a, I, I ask them to reflect. I have several questions I ask them to respond to. I also ask them to identify an accountability partner. It's mm -hmm. interesting, many choose a parent mm -hmm. to be their accountability partner. This accountability partner is someone who will check in with them weekly and say, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we just, we, we monitor. And then at the end of that period, we ask them to reflect. Uh, I do this in all my classes, regardless of the subject, because I've, my teaching, particularly in a business school, is a professional school. We're supposed to be teaching skills and capabilities, mm -hmm. not just content. And as I've done that, I have seen a, an extraordinary impact on my students, even within a very short period of time. Uh, students can make some significant gains. Mm -hmm. um, and then at, at Northeastern, this was incorporated into the international business major where students began doing these sorts of things in their freshman year and continued all the way through to graduation. So this was an iterative process. They would do this four or five times over the course of their education. And as they did it, mm -hmm. with each iteration, they got better at doing it. It also became, I would say, habitual mm -hmm. among our seniors as they were doing this. They would accomplish, and even without prompting, they would in their reports back say, mm -hmm. okay, I, I did mm -hmm. that, I've done my reflection and now I'm setting my new goals mm -hmm. moving forward. So our, this can become, and we've seen, by the way, we've seen the same sort of progress working with managers in organizations. Once we start them down this road, mm -hmm. as they experience success and grow and develop, yeah. there's often a, a very strong desire yeah. to, to continue on with this because they feel that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, maybe I can put in a plug. Uh, GSU Cyber is organizing a pedagogical workshop uh, later. In fact, uh, they will post a note about that. This yeah. is pretty much uh, the focus of how do we build the classroom experiences to advance IB competencies and global leadership competencies is one of the central theme for that pedagogical workshop. Uh, and in fact, Joanna Blunt, uh, she works for Chick-fil-A L&D and, and she's asking, uh, how do you see inclusion competencies, behaviors, uh, assisting in intercultural relationships and stuff? I, I, I won't make a plug for the newest COSI product, which is the Inclusion Competencies Inventory. But there you go, Jonathan. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what I will say is this our perspective is to view um, inclusion and the challenge of inclusion as a subset of intercultural experiences. I'll go back to my, my, my phrasing of how do we work effectively with people who are different from us? Well, obviously one of those ways to work effectively is to have them feel included. And our experience working in that area with our, with our new instrument is we find that overwhelmingly the people we work with want to be inclusive and often mm -hmm. are struggling with how to be inclusive or what they can do to be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And uh, and our instruments have always, uh, we've always approached this from the standpoint of people want to develop, people want to grow, people want to be more effective, they want to do better. Mm -hmm. Can we help them mm -hmm. identify how to do that? Yeah, this is Dr. Barnes, uh, yeah. And, and what's the name of the instrument you mentioned? And it's called the Inclusion Competencies Inventory. Okay, Inclusion Competencies and, Inventory. And Dr. Barnes is probably quite familiar with it. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we have two more questions. We are in the entry into that last 10 minutes of the conversation. Can I, yeah. can I just say one thing? Um, Dr. Barnes and I 
uh, did a webinar. Mm. So you can find that in the archives if you'll go, mm. if you'll go, if if you're interested in learning more about that. Mm. Wonderful, thank you. And there are two questions. I think probably it goes to uh, the next slide that you have, like. In terms of competencies, what sort of competency that needs to be developed? This is from uh, Dr. Charlie Char. Yeah, uh, this is a model that uh, the Joyce and Osland and I, along with a, a number of colleagues um, from from around the world, developed in the uh, about twenty years ago. And our approach was to think for it to think in, in terms of competencies, but to start from the inside, what are what are the things that people bring with them? What are the, the values and the and the predispositions and traits? And and these competencies then from the inside, kind of how do you get your mind, how do you get your personality, you know, how do you get your uh, your predispositions oriented? But then the question is how do you work with other people? And we called those the interpersonal skills. And very broadly, mindful communication. Can I understand and can I make myself understood effectively? Mm. Um, if you can do that, then you can be effective at the next skill, which is can I build trust, mm. which is at the core of everything. And then can I work effectively with groups of people? So. We can kind of think of going from the one-on-one -on -one to the small group. And this is really the foundation. Now, within each of those, under each of those umbrellas, of course, there's some specific things we can look at. Interpersonal skills are effective for leading at, I'll say, close quarters. But effective leaders, as you move up, have to have what we would call system skills, which are the ability to take those things we do at the interpersonal level, the mindful communication, the building trust, the working in teams effectively, and carry that to a broader organization, a division, mm -hmm. uh, the, the strategic business unit. And, and those capabilities of spanning boundaries, can I work across those? Can I build communities? Mm -hmm. Can I lead change? Usually when we talk about global leadership, it is, I would say, almost invariably about leading change. It's about change initiatives. It's about taking the organization or the unit from here mm -hmm. to somewhere further along. Um, can I influence stakeholders, which is closely related to the boundary spanning? Can I make decisions that are ethical? And then architecting. And this last one, architecting, given that we have moved from a, a vertical to a horizontal um, form of organizing, much of our work involves restructuring mm. constantly. Mm. For example, Silicon Graphics, uh, the, the tech firm, nobody's in a particular department or unit. You're in a, mm. you're in a project team. And those projects can be six weeks, they can be six years, mm. but you're constantly moving. So part of the architecting skill is understanding how to structure those different groups, those different communities, so they can work effectively together. So this is a this is a general framework. And then within this, of course, we can go into you know, mindful communication. What does that entail? What are specific, I would say, more narrowly focused competencies that would be appropriate? So this is a and then across all of this is a broad global knowledge. Mm -hmm. And maybe we touched a lot on the individual style. Like, is there a way, in fact, uh, Dr. Huan's question is what strategies would you recommend for cultivating a corporate culture that that empowers and nurtures global leadership? That is, um, you know, it's interesting. That's not a question that we often often get because most of our work is, is with developing managers, developing specific individuals. But I would say that the culture that has to exist is one that, first of all, Focus on it focuses on fostering growth, mm -hmm. uh, and not just growth of the business, but growth of the people within the business. Mm -hmm. uh, organizations often say, you know, people are our most valuable resource. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the case, then you, you know, then the organization ought to be focused on, mm -hmm. on, on growing that resource. Uh, beyond that, I would say a a, a culture of openness. Mm -hmm. 
and a culture of acceptance of imperfection. Mm -hmm. We, um, especially as we climb in the organization, often there's a, an expectation that people not make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And and yet growth, and, and we it's interesting, we have some interesting research mm -hmm. uh, out of organizational theory that indicate that that confirms that organizations tend to more grow tend to grow more and develop more positively positively out of failures than they do out of success. Mm -hmm. When they experience success, they tend to simply, um, I'll say, institutionalize, concretize the things they're doing, mm -hmm. and lock into those. When they confront failure, they they end up having to re-examine, reconsider. Mm -hmm. And that becomes the the impetus for future growth. So an organization that I won't say embraces failure that sounds uh, yeah, yeah that sounds I, I, negative yeah, but I think but recognizes that, yeah. that failures will come about and yeah. then can capitalize on that with that mindset for growth. Yeah. So we are getting, ending the last few minutes. Just want a short uh, maybe if you can keep a brief answer. Like Dr. Bear Battle Char Battle is asking, can faculty led quasi internships be a uh, viable option for evaluating and enhancing student competencies while also promoting boundary spanning. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a firm believer. I'll, I'll be dropping into that later webinar on teaching. I'm a firm believer in experiential learning. Hmm. Um, my, my short answer is there are four elements to consider when we think about the experiences we give. Experiences that are complex the the more complex they are, the greater the the greater the possibility of learning from them. Uh, experiences that are affective mm -hmm. tend to be more memorable and and hence provide greater opportunity to learn from. Experiences that are intense in some way tend to focus, and in focusing provide greater opportunity for learning it. And then finally, experiences that are viewed as relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. tend to be valued. So those four mm -hmm. characteristics, if you can consider how those are built into an mm -hmm. internship program can, can be extremely effective. Do we have any research? It's one of the anonymous attendees asking like research on social versus technical, how organizations are prioritizing. Um, Shall I refer them to the, your advances in global leadership? I, no. um, you know, this is this is something that we identified about twenty years ago. I um, I I would have to go back to the the archives and and pull that up. Um, it I, I think if you if you look at uh, if you yeah, simply think, look uh, at what yeah, Chris is, what, uh, what Chris programs is, yeah. you're training. Yeah, Chris has posted one of the references from your work, so yeah. please take a look at it. And the last question, Raj is asking. How do we strike a right balance between maintaining a consistent leadership standard across the globe versus localized? I mean, the, there's the typical tension between the local and localization versus yeah. standardization. Yeah. If I had a good answer for that, mm. I would be spending more time with companies. Uh, I it's and and. Probably that's a great way to stop this and end our conversation. So this is a great topic for research and uh, quite a few researchers are on this website and I hope uh, we can we can explore that question. And and my sincere hope, uh, Alan, is like by building these global leaders, we can build a better world. Hopefully our all these uh, scholars and the leaders that we are training eventually will be able to make those connections in a world that is increasingly getting polarized and fractured that these scholars will build a community across the globe yeah. and they can be the agents of transformation. So thank you so much for taking out this time and, and spending with us. I'll hand it over back to Leanne. Thank you, Alan and Charles for the enlightening discussion. I know for the DBA students in person, attending in person, you will have additional conversations in this afternoon. I want to thank everyone for being part of our global community today. This concludes our webinars for the spring semester. We wish you all a wonderful summer. So long for now. Thank you.